Well, it really gives me a great pleasure to have the opportunity to lead this fantastic panel on what is, without any doubt, one of the most important economic sectors of the economy. As you know, basically transportation is like the circulatory system of the economy. We move people, we move goods, etc., etc. But I'm going to give you a couple of statistics to basically to kind of highlight how important this is. In any sense, basically, transportation is the, as I mentioned, the circulatory system of the economy. For every one of us in, that are here, in, in average, about 200 pounds of cargo are transported all over the U.S. Just to give you a sense about the magnitude of the flow. In cities like D.C., for instance, every single day, about 100 pounds of cargo are transported every single day. And about, for every five of us, one delivery either related to internet deliveries or deliveries to commercial establishments is made. We are talking about massive activity. This activity is tremendously important because, let me tell you why, the, the big chunk of the manufacturing takes place in metropolitan areas, about 80%. 80% of employment, 80% of establishments. If we take a look at the economy as a whole, about 45% of the American economy are related to what we call freight intensive sectors. The sectors of the economy for which the production and consumption of supplies is an essential activity. I'm talking about manufacturing, the accommodation and food sector, retail, et cetera, et cetera. This is an activity that is tremendously important. 45% of establishment in this freight intensive sector, 50% of employees. What that means is that any inefficiency in the transportation of passengers and freight directly impact half the economy. That gives you a sense about the Why is that important? Well, we cannot have advanced manufacturing if we have dumb transportation systems. In essence, the, the way in which we move people, the, the way we move freight, have to be as intelligent as the, what the economy should be. And right now, a major challenge, challenges. With the rise of internet deliveries, the amount of freight traffic in city has doubled. And if we follow the path of places like Seoul, South Korea, that will triple within a matter of two or three years. We need to do something about it. Why does that matter? Well, if 80% of the manufacturers are produced in, in metropolitan areas, we need to deal with congestion. Do you have an idea about how much congestion adds to the cost of transportation? Any ideas? 100%. 100%. Yes. And in countries like Bangladesh, it's 300%, between 300 and 500. And basically, and what you have, basically, in a, in a, in a, in a, global, in a globalized environment in which we are competing with everybody else, we need to be intelligent and deal with those root problems. We have the, I have the great pleasure of having here a distinguished set of panelists. They are going to talk both about transportation of, of, of people using new technologies and also the transportation of goods, which is basically very close to my heart. We have here, uh, without Peter Fraser, who's going to talk about the, uh, the interconnection between uh, Uber and the uh, new technologies. Uh, uh, Puja De Wan is going to talk about her experience with BNSF. Steve Shashihara, the CEO of Princeton Consultants, is going to give us his take on, the, on how to use OR to improve the efficiency of transportation. And we have Saif Ben, uh, ben uh, Jafar, is going to talk about these uh, new trends related to the, to the sharing economy. We are going to have the panel uh, going in alphabetic order. And then, uh, Saif, we have all yours. OK, great. Uh, good morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you to the organizer for putting together this exciting event. Thank you, Jose, for the introduction. Uh, so I, I have some notes. I'm going to be following them so I stay on time. <laughs> um, uh, so as Jose mentioned, I study uh, sharing economy with particular focus on shared mobility, shared transportation. Uh, in the brief time I have, I'm going to uh, attempt to do three things. First one is uh, tell you, um, talk a little bit about uh, the, both the promise and the perils of the sharing economy and shared mobility. Um, uh, then talk about the role of analytics 
uh, as a core uh, enabling technology for sharing economy and shared mobility. And then three, speak about the importance of uh, analytics in informing the policy debate about how to regulate the sharing economy that's on the minds of a lot of uh, policy uh, makers. Uh, so let me start with a, a fun fact that on the surface has nothing to do with sharing economy. Okay, so uh, this is a little statistic about uh, power drills. Okay, so uh, many of us have power drills at home. Apparently there are 80 million of these power drills in the U.S. Guess the average time a power drill is used over its lifetime. I would say 1%. Well, how many, how many, how many uh, hours, uh, days, uh, yeah. et cetera? Hour. An hour, hour okay. Hour day? No. <laughs> An hour over. I, I yeah. <laughs> Not even close. It's 15 minutes. Wow. <laughs> it's 15 minutes. It's 15 minutes. Okay, so what does this have to do with transportation? Uh, so a power drill is similar to a car in two, uh, in two aspects. We, just like with power drills, we have lots of cars. There are 250 million cars in the U.S., over a billion worldwide. And uh, just like the power drill, the car is very poorly utilized. Uh, the average usage of a car is about 5%. And if you take into account that a car could seat five people and most trips are single occupant, that uh, utilization of a car drops to uh, something like 1%. So ridiculous, uh, ridiculous number. Uh, so th these are two examples of many categories of products that we own. Uh, some of these, uh, some of these products, some of these assets are expensive, like in the, uh, like the case of the car, rapidly depreciating. Uh, the car occupies valuable space when it's parked. We build all this infrastructure to support its deployment, uh, and it's poorly utilized. Uh, so the sharing economy is built on this idea of tapping into this idle capacity. This 95% or 99% idle capacity that's out there, it's capacity that's distributed, it's not in the, in the hand of a single entity. And uh, this has been uh, made uh, possible by leveraging um, online platforms that can efficiently uh, bring together uh, owners of these assets and users of the assets. Um, so in the case of uh, the car, this has taken, uh, uh, this has taken uh, many forms. Uh, so one is P2P or peer-to-peer -peer product sharing. So when you own a car, you can put it up for rent when you're not using it, and those who don't have a car can now have access to it. Uh, the fact that there's a car to be rented now could lead some people to forego ownership and just use a car on demand basis. So this is one version of the sharing economy uh, in, in the context of cars. The other version is uh, ride, uh, ride sharing and ride matching. So when you go into a destination, you can pick people up. Okay, so you can fill up that extra capacity in your car. Uh, a third version is ride hailing and uh, as an Uber and Lyft, where now the owner of the asset also provides a service. And uh, perhaps the most more traditional version is uh, traditional car sharing, where a third party uh, owns all the assets, so ownership is taken from the hands of the individuals, and uh, this third party provides access on an on-demand basis. Um, um, so uh, sharing brings uh, obviously value to all the participants uh, for owners. Now this expensive asset can be monetized. Your car can become income generating for you, for example, if you put it up for rent when you're not using it. Uh, for individuals who don't own a car, now they have access to a car. Um, uh, some individuals who are on the margin between uh, owning and not owning maybe now can forego ownership. Uh, and use a car on an on-demand basis. Uh, so society could benefit because potentially this could reduce overall uh, car ownership. Uh, so that means fewer cars on the road, less congestion, less pollution, uh, fewer car accidents, um, and, and, and so on. But also a, a few, less investment right, in this infrastructure and roads and parking garages and so on. Uh, so that's the, the pro uh, side of, uh, so this is the promise, if you may, of sharing economy. There's a flip side, there's perhaps a dark side to this, 
Uh, so uh, the fact that a car can, can now generate income for you could encourage people who didn't own a car now to own one. Uh, the fact that the car now is more conveniently accessible through these platform could encourage usage. Uh, and there are, uh, there's evidence of both of these phenomena that you introduce sharing and ownership goes up rather than go down. Uh, there's a nice, uh, there's a nice uh, um, uh, a study in China that looked at cities uh, before and after Uber and Didi. Didi is the, uh, the Uber counterpart in China. Uh, um, uh, and uh, cities that uh, where Uber entered uh, saw a marked increase in car ownership. Um, uh, there's also there has been also this debate in New York about uh, uh, traffic in markedly. Uh, s has, has markedly slowed down. So average traffic in midtown Manhattan has slowed down by 15% over the last uh, uh, two or three years. And the city of New York has pointed the finger at Uber uh, as uh, you know, tried to cap, uh, uh, <laughs> cap, uh, cap Uber cars and uh, Uber and Lyft cars. Um, the fact that the sharing economy businesses are regulated has also raised questions about fairness to incumbents, taxis. Uh, so taxis have been hurt. Uh, the, the value of a taxi medallion has dropped by more than 50% in many cities. And then for services that rely on um, crowdsourcing, uh, there has been questions about uh, labor, uh, labor practices, right? Uh, fairness to workers. A driver for, uh, for a service like Uber and Lyft brings the, the, the asset as well as their time. They're not guaranteed income. They're the ones who are facing all the risk associated with demand shocks. And so on. Um, there's also risk about. Uh, there's also risk of new monopolies emerging. A lot of these uh, shared mobility uh, services require scale, right? That's uh, that's uh, how they can be profitable, and uh, that in the long run could mean uh, the, the emergence of only uh, uh, one player, right? That could become uh, that become a monopoly. Um, there are. Uh, I don't know how much more time I have. I do have more. A couple of minutes. Okay. There's also there are also questions about the use of public infrastructure. Uh, uh, so I've been involved in a project that looks at uh, one-way uh, car sharing systems, uh, uh, like Car2Go. I don't know if you're familiar with Car2Go, but their business model is built on this idea that you can pick up a car anywhere and drop it off anywhere. Uh, this requires cooperation from cities in allowing car-to-go cars to be parked uh, in, in uh, for example, parking meters. So there's this debate about whether cities should, uh, uh, should, uh, uh, should incentivize uh, uh, businesses like car-to-go, perhaps subsidize parking, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, let's see. So the fact that there are pros and cons, and uh, the answers are not uh, clear, um, is why analytics is important. Right? Uh, we need, uh, as uh, General Hayden mentioned, uh, an evidence-based approach, a data-driven approach, um, and the more importantly, perhaps a model-based approach that could allow us to uh, understand better how these various moving parts, right? This tension that exists between, for example, you introduce sharing and ownership could go up or, or go down depending on the circumstances and usage could go up and uh, go down, uh, right? So um, uh, there's a need for, for example, uh, simulation models that can allow us to experiment with, uh, with different policy instruments, right? If we're thinking about regulation and how different uh, uh, how we set these, uh, uh, the values for these, uh, for these policy instruments could impact outcomes and could affect uh, consumers, businesses, uh, the environment, uh, labor. Um, and if uh, time, uh, time allows it in the Q&A session, I'll be happy to elaborate on a couple of studies we did. Uh, uh, finally, let me, know, uh, let, me know, let me conclude by noting that the main technology enabler for a lot of these platforms, uh, and I'm sure Peter will talk more about this, is really analytics. The thing, that the, the, the value that these platforms bring to the table is their ability to efficiently match supply and demand, to deploy resources in an effective way. Uh, uh, to, uh, to be able to navigate the spatial mismatch between where demand is and where supply is. Uh, ability to, to position assets uh, in, in an effective way. Um, 
So, so, so with that, perhaps I will conclude. Let me just uh, mention this, uh, this, uh, this, this quote from Tom Goodwin from his recent book. Uh, so he says, Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media, uh, media owner, creates no content. Uh, Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, uh, has no inventory. Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. <laughs> Something interesting is happening. And uh, I would argue, so all of these are examples of these, uh, these platform that, uh, that, that what, what, what they have in common and what, where, where they bring value is really in analytics. So the platform revolution is in so many ways the analytics revolution. So Fantastic. With that, let me Thanks a lot. Stop. <laughs> let's basically, let's take uh, time for one or two questions, and then we'll have uh, questions at the end. Yeah, I, I think you did a great job talking about the interactions of all these things, and you said we have no answers. I'm not so sure I knew what your question was. However, uh, do I need a car to be utilized or a smart phone? Uh, is that my objective function? I, I'm having trouble grappling with what would you like to solve? So the champions of the sharing economy and of shared mobility make the case that this is a more sustainable way of uh, delivering uh, transportation, delivering mobility. And what I, what I uh, so, so this, this will, will lead, for example, to fewer cars on the road, and that's a good thing. My, my uh, the, the thing I, I, I want to caution uh, is that uh, there could be uh, unforeseen consequences that it's important that we understand the system and the various trade-offs. Okay. And this is why analytics is important. Because indeed, you, you may subsidize in certain places uh, uh, shared mobility, and you end up with more traffic rather than less traffic, more cars Fant than fewer Fantastic. Cars. Let's stop here and let's move. Saif, great talk. Now we're going to move to Puya Dewan. She's a chief data scientist for at BNSF uh, Railways. And uh, it's a free person. I said, uh, I feel like I know. <laughs> <laughs> she has been there for almost 20 years, and uh, I mean, Puja, we're all yours. Hi. So, uh, Jose already introduced me. I'm the chief data scientist at BNSF Railway, and most people think railways are the choo-choo trains, no <laughs> technologies, <laughs> and um, so I'm going to try to spend time to first introduce a little bit about BNSF and what we play the role in the freight economy itself. And then more per se, to talk about a few examples of how my team is actively using analytics in this economy to help drive you know, BNSF efficiencies. And if given a chance, I would like to address your question later on, which you, I know you are safe, but I think it is of very deep consequence and something that you know, our earlier plenary speaker and Secretary Anthony Fox also talked about is that we keep focusing on transit time and end-to-end -end solutions, and that's not the key. I think pu public policy should have a place in it, so I'll get to that. So talking a little bit about BNSF Railway. So we are a Berkshire Hathaway subsidiary, um, you know, a Fortune 10 company, uh, 32,500 miles of tracks spread over 28 states and three Canadian provinces, and headquartered out of Fort Worth, so a big company. Um, we have about 41,000 employees, um, and uh, we are the largest freight railroad in North America. So we play a huge part, and you know, most people, when they talk about transportation policy, I'm glad Jose represents the freight industry perspective of it, kind of focus on what the voters are going through, which is the congestion on the roads, and what people are enduring, and kind of focus on the road system and not think about the bigger policy system of what the railroads help in the whole infrastructure and policy decisions. So from that, I'm going to kind of jump towards what is the role a transportation system plays. Most important, safe. You know, you need to provide transportation services that are safe, that are cost effective, and green. I mean, you need to think about it from a holistic end-to-end -end systems perspective. What's best for the North American consumers, not just for one company and the other company and the people, but overall. So at BNSF, we are using all the things Laura talked about, you know, the advanced analytics, machine learning, AI, optimization, and we are solving problems that, you know, Frankly, every day customer working with BNSF is interfacing without realizing with us. 
So we are solving problems. If you place a customer request and you place for an empty car, there are giant optimization systems that are already predicting what's the supply, what's the demand, how do we best reposition and get you as a customer your car on time. Uh, we, you know, people don't think about the railroad, but it's a giant network. It's a huge puzzle to solve. So how we run the trains, what times are the best trains to run, what, how do we switch our cars, what's the most efficient and safe way to switch our cars in our yards so that we can provide a cost-effective solution. All of that's designed by some of the systems designed by my team. How cars are routed through the system, the moment it hits BNSF, we know exactly how we will send you on one train to another train till it reaches the destination. So that's just the customer perspective from how we route our assets around. Now let's look at, you know, I talked about 32,000 miles of track. So we're an outside spoke. How do we maintain those assets? Things are going to go wrong. So we are big data at scale. You know, you think about it, we have sensors all over the place, and I'll just in a moment give you some concrete examples. But how do we manage and maintain our infrastructure? We spend, you know, three and a half billion dollars a year in our investment to keep up our infrastructure. So what's the best place to strategically put and invest for capacity? How do we maintain it? How do we uh, think about predicting things happening so we can have a safe, reliable infrastructure? Something that the government does for the, the transportation highway network, we worry about it from our own rail network. So, you know, maintaining those assets is another key area that we invest in. How we route schedule. So, Laura and Christian talk about how we assign crews to, you know, flights. Similarly, we have to think about our crews. How do we give them the proper work time, proper rest time? How do we make them move around? So, you know, really in any area of BNSF where you're touching, my team's embedded to try to make us focus on the most important things, safety, the efficiency, and the green aspect of it. So we are there to kind of help us set up for being the most you know, efficient and innovative railroad out there to be working with. So with that, I'm going to give you a couple of examples where my team's done work. And I think the reason I like to focus is because in BNSF, safety is so important. We really never even begin a conversation in BNSF without having safety instructions of what are the exits and what are they, who's going to respond. So uh, the couple of examples I want to pick up in BNSF that are safety related. So trying to take you away from the choo-choo train kind of mindset to let us let you know how tech technologically savvy we are. Um, there are over the 32,000 miles of track you see out there, over 4,000 detectors that generate 35 million readings per day. Okay, Those detectors are measuring forces on the train, they're measuring temperatures on the bearing, there are images being collected that we can, we fly drones, we are collecting images, we are basically using all this data, we are validating through the algorithms to figure out did we really identify the right issue with the right car, and then we try to say, okay, how do we use this information to prioritize the way we are maintaining our assets? Do we need to respond? Do we need to stop the train? Or do we need to say this is a part of a predictive maintenance itself? So that's one place my team's very, very actively engaged in. Um, and in fact, some of the, you know, the deep learning models that you see in autonomous cars in terms of image recognition, we are doing that. We use images coming from the field to exactly look at the images and automatically detect, are there cracks? Is there things that you are not seeing or hearing just now uh, that are not even visible by eye? And can we combine all of those sensor readings to help the person who's maintaining the car make a better decision? So that's one area that we are really proud of. The, another area that we are really proud of that my team works on is on the engineering inspection of the assets itself. Again, 32,000 miles of track, we use a lot of sensor automated technologies to try to um, you know, detect the cars, geometry cars that are just running like trains and basically creating measurements. And so think about it, those, they, they are like big data centers moving around. So you can't have people in the loop 
measuring those things. You have to have algorithms that are smart enough to understand, OK, what are you finding out? And how do we use that information to predict? Do we need to fix the infrastructure and create surfacing? And who is the person who needs to respond? Um, so that's another area that, uh, you know, again, all towards infrastructure. And the, the last one I want to talk about, and I know Jose is standing up to give me an indication, which means I'm running to time, so I'll answer your question later on, is that, that we're pretty, I mean, I thought was very innovative and very proud of. So customers place demand, and one of our, you know, very oldest optimization uh, systems used to tell which car needs to be assigned to that customer so that we can serve you on time with the right kind of car you want. In the past two years, we designed a system that looked at, OK, you have many customers the same terminal is serving. And we also know, as a customer, what your needs are versus what her needs are. So can we virtually see that is there cars that are being assigned to you and her that can be exchanged? And I can save work, which we call as pin pulls, because people have to get between two cars pull up a pin to kind of switch up cars in a track. Thousands of cars being switched and pin pulled every day. We rolled out this product last year in the five yards to pilot it out. Uh, within months, we rolled it out of a system. And, and that product has saved over 20,000 pin pulls in a matter of months. And what that means is safety exposure. So you as a customer is still getting cars, but our employees, whose safety number one is very important to us, we are now making sure we are leveraging their work and making sure we assign cars. For example, if his cars were spread out over two tracks, we're going to make sure we are minimizing the pin pulls for the, for the employees to work on. So again, great smart analytics. People didn't think about it but something that helps us be efficient and be a safer railroad. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Fantastic. Jose. Fantastic. And by the way, I like choo-choo trains. You like choo-choo trains? <laughs> I told my husband a long time back, he can never compete with my coolness of the job. I have two boys. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Question for, uh, one or two questions for Puja. I have a question about the, uh, yes. in an area in which there are so many uh, potential disruptions in transportation systems. Yes. I mean, particularly things like a truck platooning, connected trucks and that. Mm -hmm. What do you see coming down? What, what is the, the real industry doing to kind of stay ahead? So I'm glad, Jose, you go there. And I think it kind of leads towards the policy discussion and kind of the question I was trying to answer before mm -hmm. over there was, so absolutely platooning um, uh, autonomous <coughs> trucks is going to have a disruptive effect on our industry. It's also a positive effect. There are places where we can leverage yeah. autonomous ourselves. So, but you have to think about it on a macro scale. And I think that's where some of the public policies need to think through. I'll give you an example. Nobody thinks about it, but one train moving out there in the system carries several hundred trucks yeah. worth of load. Okay, Several hundred mm -hmm. trucks worth of load. Yet, most of the freight wants to move on the trucks. Why? Because the investment that is made to maintain that infrastructure I talked about is about done by the railroads. It's about $5 million a mile. No. Whereas in the other case, the taxpayers are paying, and you're thinking about the thing that Secretary Fox talked about, that it's very counterintuitive for us to think about reducing a four-lane to a three-lane. But something to think about is, is from public policy's perspective, we keep dealing with congestion, and we keep dealing with increased traffic, but part of that traffic is bigger, heavier trucks. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at it from a system's perspective from North American, you know, U.S. perspective, we should be thinking about why those policies are driving those trucks to be on yeah. the road and not on the train. We need to think about multimodal solutions. Yeah. So yes, trucks have absolute role to play. Yeah. 
but why in long distance? I mean, when you can have 500 miles, that one ton of freight. So I'll go step back. So we use a gallon of fuel to transport one ton of freight for 500 miles. So step back and think about the math. We are one of the greenest way of surface transportation. Yet we don't carry that much in terms of our freight. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the policies that drive that discussion around there. So absolutely, platooning will make things worse. But if you drive the policies in a direction where the trucks are also bearing the share of what that cost, which is billions of taxpayer dollars that we spend every year, every five years in those bills, if we have that kind of taken up by the trucking, then you will have a different systemic solution, perhaps lesser congestion. Perhaps four to three lane kind of a solution. I mean, honestly, it's 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 every entity. Here's where public policy is driving kind of traffic to go down a path, which all of us know we don't know optimization. If you create a path with zero cost, what does it do? It's going to push flow through that system. Anything that has cost will reduce the flow through the system. So I I see kind of this is a mixed bag. But I also know that you know the technology is moving fast. It's happening. So I think in terms of public policy, we need to think about it. How do we not think about point-to-point -point solutions, but a lot of integrative network? Fantastic. Okay. With that, let's move to the, uh, our next speaker. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Peter Fraser is an associate professor at Cornell University in upstate New York, where I come from, and uh, he's also had this uh, dual role as a researcher and also as a practitioner in his role in Uberpool. Peter, we're all yours. Thank you, Jose. Uh, it's great to see all of you. Yeah, so, so my name's Peter. I'm a professor at Cornell, and in 2015, I got to take a sabbatic leave. A great thing about being in academia is every, every so often you can just leave and, and do anything you want. Um, so <laughs> I, thought, I thought it would be interesting to go and get a real job. Uh, Ian, we need that in BNSF too. <laughs> and, so, and, and so I went and I, I got a job as a data scientist uh, at Uber. So I worked first as a, just as a regular data scientist on the Uber pool team where our mission is to uh, create a, par a carpooling product that is easy to use, that people like, that's inexpensive, um, that has benefits both for the individual consumer who's interested in a low-cost, convenient way to get where they're going, but also has benefits for society in terms of reduced congestion, uh, reduced air pollution. So I did that, and then um, I ended up managing the team for about a year, uh, and then I switched to another team and worked on um, making Uber better for, for drivers, building a, a product where drivers who need to go home or need to go to, um, need to, go to their job and need to be there by a particular time um, can, instead of just turning off the app and driving there empty, can say through the app that, hey, I need to be, you know, I need to be at this address in Queens by 3.45 p.m. because I need to pick up my daughter from school. Uh, and so we would get them a trip going in that, in that direction. So, so that's what I work on now. Um, I was full-time at Uber for, uh, or mostly full-time for about two years, and then now I'm, I'm a part-time employee and I, uh, and I do more of the regular professor stuff uh, and, and live in Ithaca. So what I wanted to do was just talk about how we use operations research and analytics at Uber, and in particular um, on Uber Pool in order to in order to make it all work. Um, so there's two kinds of things that we do. So one is we use statistics, machine learning, in order to, um, in order to understand how the market works, in order to make predictions for what's going to happen in the future, um, in order to inform uh, business people about what the impact of a particular decision might be. And then the other thing that we do is we use optimization and, and uh, you know, sort of the tools of operations research in, in order to make decisions. Um, maybe I'll start. You, you asked a, a very nice question, which is, uh, you know, what are we trying to do? Um, 
So Uber Pool is a very complicated product. There are a lot of stakeholders. There's the rider, but there's not just one rider. There are multiple riders. There's the driver partner. The driver partner is not an employee, right? The driver partner is a customer. And their value, their, you know, the quality of the experience for the driver partner is just as important as the quality of experience for the rider, right? So um, if we make a change to the way that carpooling works at Uber, what will the impact on drivers be? Then there's Uber itself. So, you know, um, we can lose money for a while, but we can't lose too much money and we can't lose money uh, for too long, right? So there needs to be a sustainable, uh, sustainable, although when you read the newspapers, you sort of can question that, uh, that statement. Um, but, you know, uh, there needs to be a certain level of uh, profitability that we need to achieve in order for, the, for carpooling to be sustainable. And then there's the positive and negative externalities on cities. Um, uh, you know, there's the, the benefit of first and last mile transportation with public transit and, and enabling uh, people to move away from owning a personal vehicle and uh, get around in cities using a combination of ride sharing, um, ride hailing, and, and public transit and walking. Um, there are negative externalities uh, in terms of congestion, which we're working to mitigate through, through the use of carpooling. Um, uh, right, so, so that's, that's, that's an additional stakeholder. Um, and so actually, you know, what we end up doing a lot of the time is we, we put a lot of effort towards measuring value using statistics, using ideas from decision theory, using ideas from economics, measuring the value that we're creating for individual stakeholders. And then we add them up. And um, that's what an economist would call social welfare. And we often seek to maximize social welfare subject to, subject to a constraint on that, you know, no individual no individual participant um, uh, is damaged through the process of, of this particular, through this particular transaction. So a specific example of that um, is when we, when we decide which car to send to pick you up when you make a request to go from, say, here to the airport on Uber Pool, um, we look at a large number of you know, other trips that are ongoing uh, that may have other riders in the vehicle and also what we call open cars, so a car that doesn't have a rider in it, you know, a driver who's available to take a trip. And then uh, an algorithm, a very fast algorithm, because it needs to do computations more than 200 times a second, um, computes what will happen to all the participants in that transaction if we send that particular car to come and, and, you know, and bring you to DCA or to BWI. Um, and part of that computation needs to understand the, the human experience of inconvenience associated with carpooling. And when we first started out, we thought, well, what, really, you know, what is really the inconvenience in carpooling? Well, it's the extra time that you spend because you had to pick somebody else up that slows you down in getting to your destination. And so what we'll do is we'll just make sure, you know, we'll, we'll pick a number, let's say 15%, 20%, five minutes, 10 minutes. We'll pick a number and we'll say that, you know, through the use of carpooling, you're never gonna go more than, uh, you're never gonna take more than X percent of time uh, as compared to what you would have taken if, if um, you had requested on UberX and a driver had come and picked you up and brought you directly there. So we did that. Um, and it was reasonably successful, but we've had lots of complaints. And if you've ever used Uber Pool and you've had a bad experience, um, uh, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> it's partly my fault. Um, what we, so what we did is we looked at, you know, General Hayden talked about evidence and, you know, and, and data and basing, basing decisions on, on truth. So what we did is we went and, and looked at data to try to understand what aspect, what actually is it about a carpooling experience that makes it a good experience or a bad experience? And we found super interesting things. It turns out that people don't actually care that much about the extra time that's added to their trip. They care a lot more about extra stops. It turns out that that's a lot more, um, that's a lot more salient 
uh, we, we think that that's because it's a lot more salient in the mind of the rider. If, if, you know, if an extra minute passes, you don't necessarily notice that so much. But if you stop, you've already got you know, an extra person in your vehicle, and you stop and, and you pick up one other person, that, that event is just really likely to make you annoyed. Right? So extra stops. Um, also, it turns out people don't like to go backwards, uh, even, if, <laughs> even if you take the same amount of time to get to destination. And so this all comes from, you know, these statements all come from looking at the data, from analyzing how people behave. Um, and so, you know, just to close, uh, uh, operations research and, and analytics is just critical. It's critical to making carpooling work. It's critical to making the, the regular UberX experience work. Without these things, um, these products, you know, wouldn't exist. Uh, and so, and it's been, it's been, it's been a real pleasure. It's also been a challenge um, being a participant in trying to create a better, um, a better uh, carpooling experience for the world cities. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to take Fantastic. them now or later. Peter? One or two questions for Peter. I do have one, because basically in the, uh, I mean, the logic of system like Uber in, in areas like uh, big cities, New York, San Francisco, kind of, kind of obvious. But also uh, in rural areas, for yeah. example, upstate New York, you know, the, the, uh, where I'm going to. Mm. Uh, basically, what role could, I mean, a sharing economy system like basically like Uber could play in, for both the transportation of freight also and the tra transportation of passengers? Because in our rural areas where we live, you and I, basically it's kind of uh, sometimes making a delivery to a single house could be tremendously expensive. What, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah. Um, so we certainly have Uber Freight, which is a, uh, you know, which is a separate division within Uber that's looking at the efficiencies that can be created in, um, you know, in trucking. Um, we've also explored... Um, sort of a similar sharing economy model for uh, courier services in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, and another possibility, and so, you know, these are sort of dedicated, these are, uh, you know, participants, sharing economy style participants mm -hmm. that are working in a dedicated way towards delivery of, delivery of packages, delivery of freight. Um, a third thing that I think is super interesting that unlocks the potential for a lot of extra efficiency, a lot of extra, um, you know, sort of value generated for free, which is the thing that I find most exciting about working, um, you know, sort of at a, at a frontier of, of a new, new product space, new market, is having driver partners who transport people primarily pick up packages, yeah. uh, put them in their trunk, uh, drive around the city, not drive directly to where the package needs to be delivered, mm -hmm. or, or drive around, you know, a sort of a suburban area or, mm -hmm. a, you know, sort of medium density area. Um, and, uh, uh, and then when they happen, you know, and then the dispatch algorithm would understand, oh, well, there's this package in the trunk. It needs to be over here by 2 p.m. Um, you know, the, the, the passenger traffic sure. is sort of the primary traffic, but let's see if we can uh, we can bring the, we can enforce that as a constraint and, and you know, deliver on quality of service. Um, yeah, and then so, you know, you can get, you can get, yeah. basically you can get that transportation more or less for free because uh, yeah, it, you can just it, get it, over It's the marginal cost of That's inserting right. that. Like, yeah, fantastic. so it's challenging to do uh, OR and analytics. I think that you can't do it without it, but I, I think that's, that's a pretty exciting space. Fantastic. Peter, thanks a lot. At the end, we're going to have time for more questions. And now it's my great pleasure to, to, to introduce Steve, Steve Sajihara, that basically is the CEO of Princeton Consulting. He has a fantastic, a very long uh, experience dealing with the application of OR and also the popularization of OR through his book. Thank you. And basically, uh, he has a great experience dealing with using OR to address the needs of the private sector. Steve, we're Thanks. all yours. Thanks, everyone. Hi, I'm, I am Steve Sashihar. I'm the CEO of Princeton Consultants, which unlike my esteemed panelists, you probably have never heard of. So we're an 85-person consulting firm. We have offices in Princeton, New Jersey, and in uh, New York City. And for the last 35 years, we've uh, basically focused on commercial transportation companies and helping them to uh, transform themselves from what we used to call stone age decision making. 
uh, transportation as an industry has infamously lagged uh, the rest of uh, most other financial services, healthcare, and so forth. But now, in recent years, it's now being seen increasingly as a leader uh, out of, I think, necessity. Um, uh, it's an extremely, extremely competitive multimodal uh, game they're playing. Um, it, it does not uh, snare in customers and have fat margins. A lot of trucking companies run at 1%, 2% margins. So out of necessity, not because they were born uh, from the universities, in fact, quite the opposite, but because they've had to survive by using technology. Uh, our clients include uh, the Class 1 and Class 2 railroads, uh, motor carriers, both uh, truckload and LTL, uh, long haul and regional, freight airlines, steamship lines, both container and uh, barge, uh, ports, terminals, distribution centers, uh, and the largest uh, integrated global package carriers. So we have a very uh, a broad uh, experience across multi multi-modes. Uh, we learn more from our clients than we, we, we bring in, but it, one thing that is really astounding to us is how much of the American commercial transport market, I don't have a stat for you, uh, I'm not a policy person, but how much of it is funded by their own companies. As, as, as yep. Pooja said, um, uh, most around the world, we look at uh, their bullet trains and we don't realize that, that America has the best freight system across the board by far, by a long measure. But we see their bullet trains and we think, why can't we be like them? But um, BNSF is funding its own track. It's funding its own uh, uh, electrification or diesel, its own security, um, all its own equipment. And, and, and the rest of the world, many of these, just, just talking railroading, they're using um, public monies and they're subsidizing. Even Uber, as we were joking about, is struggling to make money, just as Amazon was struggling to make money. So uh, transportation is a very difficult problem and it's lured a lot of uh, otherwise um, 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 you know, smart people who most of us never thought we'd be in transportation. We thought, oh, sexier things like, uh, like financial services. But transportation is, has called at least our firm, and we found it really interesting. Um, I think that just in thinking of what, what to say to uh, my colleagues here in D.C., um, mm -hmm. I'd say that um, when a lot of people, a lot of Americans hear transportation, they think of moving people around, which is, of course, very important. But um, the freight side, which is, I think, nicely represented in this panel, um, it's the food we eat, it's the clothing we wear, it's the products we use, um, it's the materials to build and maintain our, uh, all of our infrastructure, our, our housing, uh, everything about us. So it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that the freight uh, transportation industry is as important and is as interesting to every American as uh, a passenger, whether you're driving in a car or something. It's, 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 a, it's a pretty important. And what our company has, has worked with our, our clients to do is to transition from manual and uh, spreadsheet-based assignment for allocation, scheduling, routing, and planning to digital businesses that um, uh, leverage this new smart data. The kinds of phrases one hears are operations research, analytics, advanced analytics, data science, optimization, machine learning, AI. You've heard them all. And so for our firm, we put those all together and say it's, you know, if you're academic, these they're fairly sharp distinctions sometimes between these categories, but for us, this is all one big movement. And I think particularly on the commercial side, uh, people are always trying to come up with new labels, sometimes for the same thing, just to show that it's new. So you know, one, one here is big data, and you know, what's the difference between analytics and AI? And it, well, for us, it's these, there are some distinctions, particularly when we face our academic colleagues. But I think as a policy, this is the use of, of, uh, of these smarter technologies and data to, to make more rigorous decisions. Uh, one of the reasons I'm here is because within the last year we've been asked to uh, help uh, bring this expertise to the federal government by providing uh, expert review and consulting to the birthing of this really exciting, to us exciting, set of optimization models that we use in the U.S. Census for 2020. Um, uh, um, like most Americans, I know vaguely of the census, but we didn't know anything about this until this gig. But um, every uh, uh, year uh, they tried to get people to respond uh, last time by mail, this time increasingly by uh, internet, but for the people that don't respond, they uh, deputize hundreds of thousands of Americans to go door to door to do the non-response follow-up. So anyone who didn't respond, it's called the non-response follow-ups, or NRFU, or the NRFUs. Uh, we, 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 we found that in, in federal government, everything must have a three or four letter acronym where it just doesn't count. So the NRFUs, the NRFU enumerators, or the, the counters. <laughs> And um, the, the mission of the census is to um, blanket cover, not statistically, but account, enumerate every household in, in our country. And um, 
for 2010, which is not that long ago in my view, of course I'm a little bit older, but that doesn't seem too long ago, our technique was to take these hundreds of thousands of enumerators and give them addresses and paper folders and say, during this next week, try to hit these as many homes as you're able to. But no guidance on when, where, what order, um, and just give them to them. Okay, so for 2020, the NERFU uh, enumerators will be issued smartphones each day they report for work. And each phone will have individually customized for their starting and ending locations, usually their home. And it'll pick the, uh, and, and they'll also input the number of hours able to work. And it will um, pick a, 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 a set of tasks and put them in a route um, designed to um, get the most productivity we can out of them using shortest path or traveling salesman type problems, but a lot, of, a lot of other things. So straight OR stuff, which has been around for decades. These are taught in, in to school, uh, you know, first year uh, uh, students. In, it's like an MBA program, an OR program. But our, our own government wasn't using this for something this big stakes. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, I'm, I'm getting this from public testimony, but the exciting bottom line is that um, we're going to improve uh, service, but also reduce costs by $5 billion over doing it by hand. Not a surprising thought when you think what the alternative is giving people folders and using some kind of smartphone technologies. But it's not just a cost saver, it's also we're able to hit more homes more effectively. When you give people a bunch of folders, they may be more inclined to censor certain places they want to go or not to, and we're really trying to get them. Also, and this was near and dear to my heart coming from a commercial side, is you know, when we first heard, you mean they self-report how many hours they worked and you just pay them on that? So it's like, really? You know, so, so the nice thing about the, about the smartphones is for free you get, you get time-stamped uh, breadcrumbs of where they're walking. So uh, I don't know what percent, um, this isn't where I work, but I don't know what percent were fraudulent. They have all these different systems, but, but certainly if the person seems to be sitting at home and then wants to be paid for a week's worth of work, not only is that uh, fraudulent, but it's also bad science because they're faking maybe the, the request. So this has got a lot of payback all over. It's not just cost savings, it's got a lot of positive on it. And um, the reason that I was so eager to talk to you guys, like I said, we've just done this one government gig, is because the story of this, um, this work came from insiders. And what we, what we understood, what we were told, is that this will be a room of insiders, or people from a lot of areas. And while the uh, effort was very enthusiastically supported by the, um, uh, the Scientific Advisory Board, which is part of the, um, uh, the National Academy of Science, the, the chairman of the Advisory Board for the Census, is our own Dr. Tom Cook, who is very, very storied among many of his um, uh, credentials. He started the Sabre system for American Airlines, which got spun out. He was the ninth president of Informs. He's like one of our rock stars. But he's the chairman of this advisory committee. And as soon as he heard this, he said, absolutely, go for it. Absolutely, absolutely, can be done. But the, the idea came from inside someone, people in the agency. They were insiders. They knew. Because most of them on the outside would have assumed, oh, they probably have this. In fact, I see they're selling zillions. They've got computers. They've got consultants. I mean, surely they have this. And if you, if you read the literature, it's not like people aren't telling you the truth. But, but you, if you want to hear that they're, they're using all these smart technologies and operations, research, you can hear that. But when it came to routing 350,000 people, they were doing it by hand. And so the reason that I want to uh, speak here, um, and I'm not getting paid to do this, is to appeal to you guys, where in your own organizations that you consult for, work for, look for, you're in SARS, where do you see the same kind of behavior? Where everywhere around thinks, oh, they've got zillions of dollars and consultants and contractors and, you know, but really, we're just running this thing off of spreadsheets, to be honest with you. You know, we, we do weekly schedules, and then we, we try to fix them when they break. And, you know, and, and um, 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 so there's a massive gain of taking the stuff that's working for commercial companies like the UPSs of the world. One of the um, uh, advisors on the board is Jack Levis, also of our society, of UPS. And he said, absolutely. But one thing that he mentioned, and I think everyone on our panel knows, is that you know, it's not just the science part of it. Um, we like to say that's the easy part. I, I don't think that's giving us enough credit. It's not the easy part, but it's not the complete story. Getting change to happen is very difficult, and that's another reason to reach out to you guys, because a professor or a PhD can come in with some study, but it's people like the people in this room that are going to make that happen. So I'm um, um, very happy to be here, and, um, and once again, I mean, what you guys do is uh, important to every one of us and everyone in the room, and we'd love to see our government take a lot of the techniques that have been so successful 
in the freight industry, as I mentioned in my last remark, is to say, um, regardless of what you think about our passenger system, which I know very little except as a c consumer, we have by far, by far, the most uh, efficient, safe, scalable um, uh, freight transportation system in the world. We are the envy of the world, but in, in all modes. Uh, they come here to, to learn fr from us. And so that's something we can be very proud of. And a lot of our standard of living is because of the incredibly efficient uh, competitive uh, transportation sector that we have. But thanks, thanks, for, thanks for having me. Thanks for having Fantastic. us. Thanks. Question for Steve. Yeah, sure. They looked at your problem in a different way. How can we reduce the non-response? So you may mm -hmm. recall two weeks before the April 1st uh, census date, mm -hmm. they sent out postcards saying mm -hmm. you're going to get this form, fill it out on April 1st, uh -huh. which apparently reduced the non-response 2%. And they had some number with each percent reduction right. meant in not sending these guys all over the place. Right. And right. the irony of the whole thing is um, there are plenty of very, very good statisticians in the Census Bureau who know that statistical analysis with proper impu imputation and stratification could give you a much better number than running around looking at all these households, but it's right. no less than the U.S. Constitution. That right. Uses it's the, one of the few the things that, that you must there. enumerate. That's, That's the right. uh, verb That's they right. use, which is probably giving them a lot of gray hairs because you could get a quicker, right. better, cheaper number uh, otherwise. And it's become a political issue. As you right. I mean, we're in a very narrow part of this area, so all the ways to get prior to the Nerf food or things. We hear about in the lunchroom, but we, we don't participate in. But they're, they're trying to increase um, uh, internet participation. And there's, you know, uh, when a numerator calls, um, uh, there's gonna, they're going to call multiple times. They drop a hand tag uh, if, the, if no one answers. Sometimes they're there. They just don't want to answer the door because they don't know whether someone's trying to sell them something, whatever. But they, and so uh, we'll give them some time to come back, you know, like three days or four days. But in the previous um, model, that was all just briefing. We just, we, we just talked to them, and blah, 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 PowerPoint, PowerPoint, and tried to leave some time. But we had no way of enforcing that, whether they even put, drop the hand tag or whether they come back. So now we can say, hey, we also statistically believe that this is a retirement community. It's probably better to hit them in the evenings, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, during the day, whereas most working communities say statistically it's probably a little better in the evenings. Or we tried them twice at this time of the day. Maybe we should shift to another right. So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. And, and my, the point of my story wasn't to you know, revel in the census, which is only important to one, not, well, not that small, but one group of, of people in, in professionals, you know, but just to say, in your own organizations, where are you scheduling people? Where are you scheduling resources? Where are you making uh, routing decisions, uh, assigning things? Because the, the, this OR stuff, it's, it's really straightforward. It's not, it doesn't require this leap of faith. It, it doesn't look good in PowerPoint, as, as you can see from our stuff. It's very good, though, in practice. I can take a schedule that you guys did um, each week for the last 50 weeks and, and put it through a model and say, hey, look, you know, we, we can do it with 10%. And, and it's not like you have to get rid of the 10%. What could you do with that 10% of extra utilization? You can get them doing other stuff. So it's, it's really uh, it's very exciting stuff. But I, I, one thing that is a, a little baffling for the, those of us that aren't from, from Washington is um, you know, the... the um, the narrative that we hear as citizens is that this is just like one big cat fight and everyone's screaming and yelling at each other. What we see when I walk in, uh, at least to the Census Bureau, is I see a lot of statisticians and scientists, and I don't know the politics of any of the people that I work with. And we, we hang out, but I, they just do not talk about it. You know, I really feel uh, a different Washington than the Washington that we hear about on TV. How, how dysfunctional and blah, blah, blah is. And, and, but, but at least where we're working, I, I'm, I'm very impressed. Yeah. Hi. Um, I had, a, I guess, a, more of a comment um, with your appeal to, you know, looking at areas where, you know, government entities are using spreadsheets and, mm -hmm. and kind of antiquated technologies. Mm -hmm. I think that something you'll find again and again within the federal government is it all comes down to dollars and mm -hmm. cents. I mean, you have a lot of entities that have people that are really, that really want to make a difference, but they don't have any money and they, you know, the, the agency has a license for Microsoft Office. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you're basically, my spreadsheets are free, you know, more complicated technology will cost money. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a term that's thrown around a lot is the unfunded mandate. You'll have, right. you know, the federal government will actually pass um, regulations that say, okay, we want this agency or these agencies to modernize 
their systems, and then they'll allocate zero dollars in funding to actually do that. And then mm -hmm. the agencies are expected to come up with those funds themselves internally, and they just don't have that money. So mm -hmm. even though you know the, the regulation has been passed, it doesn't really go anywhere. Um, a mm -hmm. good example is recently there was the uh, Modernization Act, the uh, I mean the Management Act, um, MGT Act, um, which was supposed to modernize a lot of the <laughs> IT systems around the government. Originally, it was proposed as a $3 billion initiative. Um, what was passed was $100 million, which really, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, mm -hmm. one agency wouldn't even be able to modernize mm -hmm. its systems using that. So, you know, great idea, mm -hmm. no money. So how do you, you yeah, know, can you I, use I, analytics I, to show? Yeah, let, let me answer it this way. I just want to uh, recognize that you know, I go, I speak on all these panels. Often, there are a lot of people that are selling software and, and either by design or just happenstance, there's no one here on this panel that's selling commercial software. Um, most of us, uh, I would, I'll just speak for our firm, we find that the most potent stuff right now is in the open source movement. So you see a lot of R, uh, Python pandas. If you want to do machine learning with the, with the very best, you're using TensorFlows from Google. The weird thing is this is all open source. So I'm not saying it's free, 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 because you're still paying for labor and so forth. But if you've got staff that have an OR background and you've been bidding them to do spreadsheets, and I don't really understand whole governments, but assuming that they can, like we, access R, you can say, you don't have to do an RFP and go to purchasing and do this massive bull of the ocean thing. You can just download it and see if there's a pony there. Now, maybe at some point, if there's a pony, you have to scale it to using a commercial product that is more, you know, there's more government friendly or something. But a lot of this stuff, it, that's the ironic, funny thing is that, it, you know, there's a lot of uh, startups, there's a lot of um, eager people that are trying to use this technology. And I, I, I would guess that there are probably employees in your own organizations that have been dying to be allowed to use a, a lot of these technologies, but just using optimization and things, it just, you, it just can't be done easily using traditional you know, uh, visualization technologies. You really have to use things like uh, uh, R and C++. Yeah. I, I like to add my perspective mm -hmm. to that important question. One of the issues I see, I deal with politicians all the time, because basically I'm at the nexus between the public sector and the private sector, and basically my, jo my job is to somehow find a way for public sector and private sector to cooperate in the solution of the problems that neither of them could solve by itself. That's what I do. What I found that, in essence, I found like uh, there is some sort of uh, asymmetry of in the in the in how to deal with risk. In the private sector, basically, the private sector is willing to take chances to try new things, because if they hit the jackpot one out of ten times, good deal. Mm -hmm. In the public sector, the the structure of incentive is against taking risk. Mm -hmm. If a private, if a public person person basically go ahead and implement, I mean, nine successful innovations and fail in the tenth one, I mean, he, he, his or her head might roll. Mm -hmm. Because again, there is no tolerance to failure. Mm -hmm. You see, there is no tolerance to failure. And mm -hmm. the tiny thing that, that uh, that person could have a fantastic track record of highly innovative work. And if something fails, or he's perceived to be failed by one of the stakeholders, I mean, she, he or she is coming down. And somehow we need to find a way to create, uh, to provide the, uh, the public sector with a safe space to innovate. And this is basically, it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily the money, because there are things that you could do, that you could innovate without money. And I could give you tons of examples of this. Some of them do need. But you need to create a, a space for the public sector to innovate. And this is a place in which universities could play a big role. When I do, I do a lot of things in New York City. And basically, I tell the, the commission of transportation, the mayor, the city council, I mean, we're going to do this as a research project. If something goes bad, you blame Jose. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and, and basically, and, 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 no, no, I, and, and basically, no, as soon as I think, I mean, and they blame me. If things go well, they take the credit. But the point is, we need to do, we need to find a way to allow for innovation to prosper. Because by the structure of incentives such that uh, it's impossible for them to take even the minor step. <laughs> because again, the, the incentive favor inertia and it's status quo. And if we do not change that, no decision maker will give it a shot. Can I think both of them give you a 
excellent perspectives mm -hmm. to challenge it. But I'm, I'm going to counter. I mean, we don't have any issues being private sector to think about tools investment. But yet, most of the ideas I talked about, more than half of it is using open source technology. Because yeah. even the tools we buy do cannot keep current with right. the R&D that's happening. I think it gives you the capability to think about, even with people that have resources, just now the better options are already in the open source world. So I think you might be constrained because in you know the government and the finance sector, you then need commercial tools eventually to get that credibility that open source doesn't provide. So perhaps just take a risk using the open source stuff and then deal with if you find value using the commercial tools. And there is also another element here is human resources. I deal with the Department of Transportation. And when I go to the Department of Transportation I visit, I see a lot of gray hair, like myself. And I see, I do not see the new generation of professionals that have to, that are going to be, going to bring new ideas. And basically, somehow we need to, uh, uh, it's, it's basically, we need to f try to innovate, but also we need to uh, take a close yeah. look at what are the conditions needed for innovation. You need to have leaders willing to give it a shot. Yeah. We need to have the people with ideas. And the resources. It basically, we need to have all things together. Oh, so can I ask, and, and yeah. add one thing? Sorry, just I want to be a little classier. So I was working for this um, industrial company, a very well-known story industrial company, and they were kind of late to the game with with analytics. We would say, uh, I don't want to say who they were, but anyhow, but they were bragging to me. I was speaking for them, doing some work, and they were bragging me how they had just hired a thousand data scientists. Yeah, this is to your, you know, um, and. Uh, <laughs> That would make them one of the biggest, I mean, by far, I mean, you know, huge. I mean, they're, I mean, okay, maybe Amazon or, or, or Google, but still a, a major player. And they were very aware of this. And so they had me, you know, talk and give workshops. And what I realized, and where I'm going with this is, they weren't a, a thousand data scientists. There were a lot of IT people, nothing against them, but the number of true, what we would truly call data scientists was a few dozen. Yeah. And they were B players. Yeah. And, and so... It's not how much you spend. You don't have to write yeah. the big check because it's a big problem. But hire a couple people of this yes. caliber, mm -hmm. not 40 like Osserants. That's what's working. But they don't have to be like super expensive Berkeley graduates, but just people that light up a room. <laughs> no, I'm just saying like you don't, you don't have to compete against against get, for the top salary. They can come from they can come from anywhere. But the, the professors here they they can tell you who their students are. They'd say like. I take that's a risk you might want to take. I can take a risk on that because this person they fought their way all the way to this degree. They're on full scholarship and holy crap, they've got the gas turned all the way up. Yeah. So yeah. put one of those people on. That's a pretty low cost bet. I, 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 I know, give the condition right, to, right. to do things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just one other practical point is a lot of professors are willing to work for free. Yeah, for the real. Data. I could imagine you know if you have a problem mm -hmm. that you're interested in exploring. You know, you could reach out to Informs. I'm sure they'd be happy to put you in contact with. No, 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 not only that, for instance. Yeah. I just piggybacking on that. One of the things that, that we do all the time, we have very good collaboration with transportation agencies, private sector, and the like. I never ask them for money. Mm -hmm. I ask them for collaboration and data. Mm -hmm. And that, and that enabled me to get funding from NSF, I mean, USDOT, and other forces. I mean, it's a matter of basically, it's not only, it's not only about money. It's about partnering with the kind of people that could help you move forward. Yeah. And, and, and that's a very good point, Peter. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, having been recently in the government and hiring one of those, an ABD statistician, the biggest thing getting to the open source is maybe we need to collaborate with the National Security Conference going on right now because the IT folks, the IT security folks, are the ones that are saying, no, 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 you cannot put that on our system. Right. So the ABD statistician we hired actually had his computer where you download everything and then do it that way off, off network. So how, how to bring that collaboration right. to the IT security portion with yes. the open right. source? Yes. I mean, we see a lot of clients. That's not shocking, that story, but it lags. We're, I mean, so one by one, each industry has realized, hey, we've got to let this in. But almost everyone, depending on who they are, if you turn back five, eight, nine years, it's like, oh, absolutely, IT won't let that through the door. You know, but that's changing industry by industry, I think. So uh, just hopefully knowing virtually nothing about government, hopefully in different uh, places where you are, that, that, that that'll crack. Now, it's one thing to put the data out there. I mean, no one should be doing that. But just saying, like, you can't use R. Like, really? 
Like, really? Like, let, let's work on that. So that, that'd be something you guys can work on somehow and just say, like, you know, just make this permissible. It's just, it's a shame, you know, to not have access to those kinds of things, which is what industry is proving out. If working with the academics might be a solution on that side. So I, I think as long as you can structurally create contracts to share data, who have more access to tools like this while you're waiting for what Steve's talking about? Because, I mean, we face the same challenges. I mean, mm -hmm. even yep. in private sector, right. we're saying about mm -hmm. when we brought open source in, we had to worry about encapsulating and the environments and where you are doing it and who maintains it. Um, and think about some cases where we want to use it versus the others not. So um, I think that and, thought and, process And also, is this. there is a, another element of that kind of collaboration. Uh, as, part of, as I said, I am basically in the middle of public sector, private sector. We get data from the private sector that basically we, that we use to address the needs of the public sector, but the private sector is willing to share data with us as a private institution, but not with the public sector. And they say, the collaboration with universities enable the public sector mm -hmm. to have a good grip on data that otherwise would not be accessible to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are kind of the things that we need to try to foster. Uh, it's not a question, but I was asked to make an announcement that lunch is available <laughs> ah. on the first floor. And <laughs> 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 okay. Nick, after that comment, do you think there'll be any questions asked? <laughs> <laughs> what's, the the what's the probability of that? <laughs> The beginning case. On the first floor. <laughs> Fantastic. But in any case, uh, we are going to be here for lunch. If you have, if you want to approach us, I will be more than glad to keep chatting with you. And with that, I want to thank you, the great thank panel you that we have. Thank you. Thank you.